In previous videos, I've discussed how multiple explorers either outright fabricated or lied on ancient African artifacts. Unfortunately, many of these African achievements were sullied due to the ethnocentric bias of well-financed foreign observers. When we think of African pyramids, we tend to think of the ones from Egypt, but the Sudan contains the most numerous. Before restorative efforts on some of the ancient pyramids, they were in pretty bad shape and their condition couldn't be holistically attributed to natural erosion. What up African world, it's Home Team here and welcome back to another video of African history, culture, and worldview. By supporting this channel on Patreon, you're helping in the creation of these videos and contributing to this content. On Patreon, you can find more in-depth courses on African history. Also, your support helps the channel grow, improving production quality and future animated projects. The link to Patreon is in the description box below. To begin, I think it's only fair to mention the cognitive dissonance I consistently find myself in with topics like these. I'm freighted with the moral dilemma of adoring these artifacts while knowing how many of them were acquired and displayed for all the world to see. Without these destructive events edging toward the thin line of dehumanization, we would perhaps never know of such brilliant African achievements, or we would discover them much later. Anyway, that's my personal struggle with this kind of history. The purpose of this video is simply to document these events and explain why the Nubian pyramids are in the condition they're in today, as many people in the diaspora might be unaware. It's hard to imagine that the Nubian pyramids were first explored by an Italian physician as there are some earlier indications of their plunder. Regardless, the individual who is principally responsible for spearheading the destruction of Nubian pyramids is an Italian man named Giuseppe Forlini. But before we tell his story of plunder and desecration, I wanted to briefly remind us of similar histories throughout the continent. One of the most egregious displays of what I would consider a form of plunder are the various forgeries of ancient African artifacts, one of the most popular being the limestone statuette of Queen Tetasheri. Before we assume the innocuous nature of the stunt, we learn from scholars that it had previously served as the basis of numerous critical assessments of other authentic African pieces. In other words, it adulterated our understanding of African art and expression. Another example of this historical genre is what I would call intellectual plunder, attributing African achievements to other peoples. The most remarkable of these inanities relating to the beautiful Ife sculptures of the Europe people. For example, Leo Frobenius insinuating that the ancient Greeks clearly taught the Africans how to do it. These invidious claims are no doubt hard to forget for anyone remotely interested in African history or proper historical perspectives in general. And so, we see this very tireless trend that was obstinately advanced by Giuseppe Ferlini. Some may even say his work was more offensive as the actual destruction of African monuments took place. Giuseppe was a 19th century Italian physician who was appointed surgeon major in the Egyptian army. After he heard of potential riches in Sudan, he asked permission from the Egyptian governor to conduct excavations. As we will soon discover, these so-called excavations were far from being done in good faith or respect for ancient history. His work was sloppy and quite rebarbative. Finally, he selected one of the largest pyramids in the northern cemetery at Meroe, the pyramid Bekarawiya North 6, measured 88 feet high and 61 feet square at the base. Ferlini had his men climb to the top of the pyramid and tear it apart hurling the stones one by one down the sides. Unfortunately, this pyramid was a tomb of an African queen named Amanasheketo. This picture illustrates how the pyramid used to look in all or most of its glory, and this picture instantiates the greed of Giuseppe Ferlini. Perhaps the most disturbing account is how Giuseppe may have acquired most of the jewels from Queen Amanasheketo herself. I'll save you guys the unsettling details of a direct quote, but a cleaned up summary is that they found the queen's tomb intact in all her decorated majesty. The irony is, after possibly undignifying themselves in the robbing of an African historical figure, 
They brought the intricately detailed ornaments to Europe, where it was largely viewed as a fake. Unsurprisingly, Europeans at the time did not believe that Africans could have achieved such skillful splendor. In 1837, Ferlini put his finds on display in Europe where they became the subject of great controversy. The treasure was so unlike any material known from Egypt or elsewhere that it was widely pronounced a forgery. Still, others considered the jewels a connection of stray Roman pieces that Ferlini had picked up on the market in Egypt. The Queen's possessions were eventually purchased and displayed for the world to see. Once Ferlini opened the floodgates, more explorers and plunderers followed his formula, and the destruction of numerous other Nubian pyramids were underway. Although Ferlini never returned to Nubia to continue his hunting spree, others did. Spurred by his narrative, these zealous fortune seekers destroyed the tops of nearly every pyramid in the Sudan. Even though this history is quite disturbing, albeit in an extreme sense, I'm reminded of the Yoruba philosophy of how good and evil work together in upholding balance in our world. Essentially, evil is in what is good, and good is in what is evil. Perhaps an embrace of this perspicacious African philosophy can help with my cognitive dissonance. We have to also remember that Giuseppe did not do this alone. He had help from employed individuals, presumably from the continent, and permission at the very least from the powers that be on the continent, even if they weren't culturally connected or reverent. But, as I said, this was a documentation of a history that many people in the diaspora perhaps knew little about. I'm hoping, at the very least, we're now properly equipped with this knowledge. Well, I'm all out, guys. If you like these videos and want to help in its continued production, consider supporting the home team on Patreon.com. The link is in the description box below. Know thyself. Remember your ancestors. Peace. Hey! <laughs>